Take it or leave it, listeners. This is Nick Farrington. And this is Ethan Wise. And this week we are bringing you an episode all about a particular shrub that we see everywhere. Uh, We get asked about all the time. A lot of them are blooming pretty heavily right now, so we get even more questions about them. And it is the Metasequoia glyptostrobotus. <laughs> <laughs> and it is the group of plants known as hydrangeas. Oh. <laughs> known as hydrangeas. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. Let me change my notes up. <laughs> okay. Hydrangeas. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I've heard of those. So there are essentially six big categories of hydrangeas. We get asked about these quite a bit. They're an extremely popular landscape plant, at least in our area. They apply to such a wide zone as far as plant hardiness zones go that they're pretty widely spread. So this is one that's extremely popular in the landscape. And spread all over the world. Yes, I true. mean, hydrangeas... To our European listeners, shout yes. out. Shout out to our <laughs> listeners in the UK and Belgium. But even though all through even China, Japan, that there are hydrangeas all over the world. And they're one of the few shrubs that you get a really long bloom season out of. Yeah, that's it's one of my go-tos when people want a shrub that has a long lasting, that's not a rose. Mm-hmm. Now, in some more southern climates, you have something like a crepe myrtle. There's Rose of Sharon, which is a type of hibiscus. But as far as sometimes when you get further north right. uh, into the northern zones and you start to kind of even move away from the hardiness zone of roses. Right. Yep. And, you know, I don't live in Michigan or northern Wisconsin or northern Minnesota, so my knowledge is somewhat limited as maybe there's other flowering shrubs up there, but I would imagine that a go-to for a lot of people in northern Michigan, if they wanted all summer long flowering plant, some species of hydrangeas would be a go-to for them. Right. Yeah. If you want a long season of color, they are definitely one of the best choices that you can go with. Mm -hmm. And you're also getting across these categories, you're getting a lot of different color and bloom type variation too, Mm -hmm. whether that be a white or a green bloom or something that's more on the pink end or the blue purple end or white that fades into pink, depending on the variety, you can get a really nice color spectrum and even in the same yard you can utilize these different types of hydrangeas right on the same property to get a really nice variety of of color also on to kind of uh, piggyback on the different colorations you also have a variety of sizes true there's pretty much a hydrangea to fit a two foot by two foot area depending on your sun conditions all the way up to 10, 10 foot 12. by yeah, yeah yeah exactly so as could, well as tree form there's ex- some tree form of mm-hmm. some of these varieties if you want something with a defined trunk as a smaller ornamental tree usually in the 8 to 12 foot tall range right. so we're going to do a brief little episode here where we break down the six different common species of hydrangeas sold here in North America, primarily the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular species that you want to start with? What's your favorite? My favorite is definitely the mountain hydrangea or hydrangea serrata. I Uh, feel like to the average listener, that's going to be one of the ones that's a little bit more obscure. I think the average listener is going to not know as far as other hydrangeas go, the mountain hydrangea. So interesting choice. Go into it. It's one of my favorites because... Of its generally compact size, a lot of the varieties you see tend to come from the more well-known brands. Proven Winners has some. Uh, I think Monrovia carries a few varieties. But essentially, they are usually going to be in the one and a half to three to four foot size range at the most. Mm -hmm. So great for smaller spaces. A lot of people who are putting plants in their landscapes anymore don't want these huge, massive shrubs because a lot of people have found out the hard way that all these compact yews or burning bushes that they saw. Oh, compact. Well, compact means, you know, branching structure, branching structure or, size. or seven to 10 feet tall instead of 12 to 15 feet tall. So a lot of people are getting away from those larger shrubs, I've noticed, or want to be able to look out their window outside and not have it be obstructed by a shrub. A lot of people have a smaller garden space to work with, you know, if you have a small yard or they just don't want to maintain something that's going to get that large. Right. Size is a huge deciding factor for, I think, in particular, homeowners. Yes. uh, As far as picking plants. 
once a plant in my experience in the decade that I've been talking to people about plants in their landscape, once a plant starts to get over the five foot range, you can see interest on average really drop. Really drop. And it's harder to, I mean, it's physically harder to prune. Mm-hmm. Like if you're an average height person trying to, to use hedge shears <laughs> on your, yeah, your eight foot tall oak leaf hydrangea to prune it or whatever, or your, your burning bush, that's not a, like, if you're having to get out head shears and a ladder and rakes to do... I'm just going to move. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just, just throw the house away. Right? I, don't, I don't even want to do that. Right. And I'm a horticulturist. Right. I don't want to do it unless I'm getting paid to do it. Let me put it that way. Right. Exactly. Which means that my house is not happening. Right. <laughs> unless my wife is like, honey, I'll give you 50 bucks if you prune that shrub. <laughs> I'm like, okay. All right. There that sounds go. good. Yeah. Yeah. So to circle back to the mountain hydrangea, that more compact size is a favorite selling point of mine because it only gets to that smaller size range and also it blooms on old wood. So you don't want to prune those heavily since they bloom on old wood and the flower buds for the next year are set on that old previous year's growth. If you prune them heavily, you won't get very many flowers because you've essentially pruned off those flower buds. So, right. But since the shrub only gets maybe three feet or so, maybe plus or minus, depending on the variety, other than if you get a wonky errant branch or a funky shape going on a branch, there's really no need to do much. Or you dropped a bowling ball on it or right. something yeah, like that. Yeah. As one, yeah, that does happen sometimes. Um <laughs> There's not really a lot of pruning that you that needs to be done, maybe trimming off some old blooms at the end of the season. But other than that, maintenance wise, extremely low maintenance. They generally are sold for more part shade to shade areas. However, they do adapt very well to sun environments. I've planted them Mm -hmm. in full sun before, especially in more northern climate zones. Yep. Yep. Yeah. They can really take much more sunlight. Yep. A lot of them are tend to be more hardy to like zone five. So if you're getting up in the Chicago and north of that area, you might want to be more specific on the variety you're picking up and make sure that it is hardy to your zone. Um, So that's something to keep an eye on. But essentially, yes, you have this smaller shrub, blooms all season, very adaptable to different light conditions. You can, depending on the variety, get a color shift You can, with acidity, go more towards the blue and purple range or with a more alkaline soil. If you're not specifically adding a soil acidifier, you can get more in the pink range. So you do have some variability there in colors. And and they, as far as shade, go quite a bit of variation to lighter to darker shades Mm -hmm. of colors. But yeah, also a lace cap flower. I was just about to say, if you didn't bring that up, it's like just Mm -hmm. kind of, it's not going to have that traditional ball i think a lot of times when people think hydrangeas they think of that that that, ball of flowers right that tight kind of cluster of flowers Mm -hmm. creating that image of a large flower ball or cone Mm -hmm. these are more flat and so you see colored buds in the middle and then those open blooms on the outer edge so it's it's also a little it's a hydrangea but it looks different than what people typically think of as a hydrangea so it's a nice variability in the landscape than a traditional hydrangea now the downside to them with as much as i love to use them they are sometimes kind of tricky to find yes Um, it's not nearly as common right right so when you find them if you like the look of it get it because it might not be there next i would say of the six hydrangeas that we're going to talk about it is the second hardest to find yes i would agree yeah so what's your favorite pick my favorite my go-to is the panicle hydrangea. Mm-hmm. I talk about that plant with a severe bias. Yeah. And That's probably the one I use the most. Sure. Only because I can't find more mountain hydrangeas. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, a panicle hydrangea is usually going to grow significantly larger, too than a mountain. You're not going to find a mountain hydrangea that's going to get six foot tall. Right. So, right. you know, you're kind of limited as far as panicle hydrangeas go for finding something small. 
to fit into a smaller space. Yeah, under three feet, you're not really going to find, at least of a variety that's reliable. A panicle. Yeah, like really, Bobo is about the smallest one. That gets, that I'm aware of. Yeah, yeah. three, maybe Give four or take feet. Give three to four feet tall yep. and wide. So the panicle hydrangea, uh, so this is hydrangea paniculata. Did we say the botanical name of the mountain hydrangea? Did we you did. say uh, yep. hydrangea serrata? Yep. Okay. Uh, and I think the serrata comes from that serrated edge of the leaf, that kind of sawtooth. Mm -hmm. um, edge of the large green leaf on that hydrangea serrata. So that the paniculata, the panicle hydrangea, panicle being a portion of the leaf and its connection to the stem, that's more nerdy than where we need to go. But the paniculata... Also, um, the flower shape is kind of a like a pointed upside down cone. Yes. Depending yes. on the variety. And the panicle hydrangea, sometimes you might hear it as a PG hydrangea. That was something I had never heard until mm -hmm. I came to mm -hmm. the St. Louis area mm -hmm. and someone asked for a PG hydrangea. And there I was also like, used to be a variety specifically called PG. Really? Mm -hmm. I think they kind of went out of favor with some of the other large hydrangea varieties. I'm more of like an R-rated hydrangea. Yeah. Um, TV 14 mm -hmm. seems or like to be TVMA. okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, just, I don't know. I like a little, a little bit more mature. Oh, there's my dog. <laughs> I like a little bit, a little bit more maturity in my hydrangea versus a, yes. a PG hydrangea. Yeah. So anyway, the paniculata hydrangea or panicle hydrangea, why I like it is the fact that you get an abundance of flowers on new wood. Mm -hmm. And that's very unique mm -hmm. uh, or somewhat unique in the hydrangea world. That a little means, more forgiving if you need right, to prune. Exactly. So you can prune it and it's always going to flower. All the new growth on a panicle hydrangea has the capability of producing a flower. Also, panicle hydrangeas are the hardiest as far as yes. cold hardiness goes. Yeah, those can go up to any hydrangea. Like zone three, which is getting right. pretty, pretty northern United States. Right. That is very north. Mm -hmm. So they can really handle that cold temperature if need be. Definitely a broader range than yes. the mountain hydrangea. The Their serrata. leaves are also smaller, which means they don't transpire as dramatically as others can in hot climate zones. Mm -hmm. um, where you, the larger the leaf, the more transpiration happens, and that's the loss of moisture through the leaf um, due to sun and sometimes wind. Um, so I like all those. Not as finicky with water when Correct. they're in full bloom like some of the other varieties. Correct. Now, it still likes its water. Mm -hmm. um, now, and that's something we'll kind of touch on on universal care for hydrangeas at the end of this episode. But yes, I find it to be far more forgiving to drought stress as well as far as other hydrangeas go. But with that being said, they do typically need to be grown more in full sun if you want nice full flower production. The panicle hydrangea can still adapt to shady areas, similar areas that you might put a macrophylla hydrangea or an oak leaf hydrangea generally. Uh, so I've definitely seen them look quite nice in like a northeastern exposure. Mm -hmm. um, but still, I think you get the best in my opinion, you get the best look out of it with a little bit more sun. Yeah. So we also live in zone five, zone six Midwest. If you lived and so zone six, sometimes with the summers, a little questionable as far as how much sun that hydrangea can tolerate. While it can take full unrelenting southwestern exposure in a more southern climate, you are going to need to water that plant or make sure that it is really well watered. Especially if it's in full bloom. Exactly. Or if you're in like zone seven or a zone eight climate zone and you want to plant a panicle hydrangea, you might need to consider eastern exposure or southern exposure with a tree that shields it during the western or the afternoon portion of that just to really make that plant a little bit healthier. So the con, though, I would say if I had to list a you know a con for the panicle hydrangea is you don't get that color changing capability that you can get from you, other hydrangeas. You can get a color shift from white to pink or white to pinkish Correct. red. That's pretty common. Right. So you get that change, mm -hmm. you know, that shift from the flower opening up in a usually a, a whitish tone mm -hmm. to then as that flower ages and matures you start to get shades of pinks and like or a reds. modeling yes. or a full shift into pink and red. So you get a natural color shift that you have no control over. Right. It's going to happen regardless of your 
intervention or not. Mm -hmm. Whereas you have something like a, a macrophylla or a big leaf hydrangea, which we have yet to talk about, or a mountain hydrangea where you can change the pH of the soil and over time start to notice a shift in the the, co the floral coloration. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the panicle hydrangea, and you will see these, I think one of the most common that I think a lot of people, when I name drop a cultivar name, they immediately know now what a panicle hydrangea is, mm -hmm. is like a limelight or mm -hmm. a little lime hydrangea. Now those I think are some of the least colorful floral wise. Yeah, the flowers the tend to be hydrangea more world. limey green. Right, and then they get mottled pink. Yeah, later in the season. But it's definitely, right. I find them to be less striking in the landscape just because you have a light greenish flower on a, on green, a green plant. Yeah, right. But there are so many other cultivars of those. There's Pinky Winky and Quickfire and Zinfandel and Bobo is the one that is the dwarf. Bobo's an all white. Right. But I love the panicle also in the fact that you can get something. You have such a large size range to choose from. Mm -hmm. And that's also where you're going to get your tree forms. Right. So you can have a three by four foot hydrangea. That's a panicle, the Bobo, all the way up to a Pinky Winky. And they get bigger, too. I'm just or throwing Phantom. That out. Phantom, which it's, I find not nearly as common. Feet. But yeah, yeah. we'll get huge. again. It used to be there's some of these other varieties that are newer, newer hybrids that they're like, oh, we'll tweak the color a little right. bit. And or like a limelight. Limelight can get eight feet plus. Mm -hmm. yep. So you have a large size range to choose from in that option of hydrangea or in that species of hydrangea. Yeah. So and then you have those pruned into a tree form where they have that accentuated single trunk yep. and they tend to be more expensive because it takes time to get them to be at that stage. Mm -hmm. And now you have this sort of lollipop shaped tree. You see other kind of shrubs they will do that with if you're in a more southern climate you lilac might have a, right you might have a, rose, a rose that's pruned that way in more northern climates you might be able to get away with the lilac tree or like you said the rose of sharon tree so it's a fun little way to kind of put something like on the corner of your landscape or something like that that's not going to get overwhelmingly large right. you can keep a panicle hydrangea tree well maintained and happy and healthy between a six to 10 foot size range give yeah, or take more or less right yeah so yeah i would say panicle is one of my go-tos because while it is extremely sun tolerant it's also pretty adaptable to shade as well large size range new growth so people who like to prune or people who do prune without realizing that that can affect the bloom time of particular shrubs it's extremely forgiving yeah all right what's next what's next on the list I think since you mentioned the macrophylla or the big leaf hydrangeas, we could get into that one next. Cool. And macrophylla literally means big leaf. Big leaf. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and those, if you are familiar with florist hydrangeas, any of the hydrangeas that you'd see in a bouquet at your grocery store or at your local florist, that's kind of more the style of bloom that you find. It's that old leaf. English look, you yeah. know, when people say, oh, I like that English cottage or that cottage look mm -hmm. or the English gardening look. I think a lot of times people, when they say that, have macrophylla in their head. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big round bloom cluster. Like we'd mentioned before, that particular variety, you definitely can get a color shift in the flowers usually between, again, on the more acidic side, the bluish purple coloration on the more neutral or alkaline soil, the more pink coloration. And that could be a dark hot pink. It could be a pink blush. It could be a dark, dark blue purple. It could be a blue blush. So you have some variation there. And some of those macrophylas aren't going to get the blue. It's specific varieties of macrophylas right, right. that can develop that blue tone. So don't think that any macrophylla you buy, you can, with enough sulfur application or acidic fertilizer application, you get a blue. Sometimes you might only get purple sure. or a maroon tone. Mm -hmm. So just always look at the label of the particular macrophylla hydrangea or big leaf hydrangea that you're looking at to see you know, what is your, and they're usually a lot of times anymore, the tag of that macrophylla gives we'll show you a, both colors. Yeah. It gives you a color wheel to kind of expect like, okay, here's the low end. Here's the high end as far as pH goes and what kind of color you can get out of that plant. Yeah. And those, I would say generally those tend to be what in kind of the two to five foot size range. Yeah, I know there are some dwarf cultivars. Uh, I think PW Proven Winners has some dwarf cultivars. I think they're, was it their City Line? That sounds series? right. 
City Line is usually a dwarf series, and then their rhythm Couple feet. or Let's Dance maybe is, tends to yeah. be some of their smaller ones. Yeah. But then, yeah, then I think the average max size is four to five. Yeah. Now, with these, I tend to find that this is probably the most finicky of the group, would you say? They're only hardy to zone five. Yeah, and certain ones, especially ones that were really popular due to broad advertising like the Endless Summer. Endless Bummer. Endless Bummer Endless is the trade name. <laughs> yeah. I, in the 10 years of working in garden centers, almost 10 years of working in garden centers, that is the name that most of us apply to that plant yeah. is the endless bummer hydrangea right. because of the disappointing bloom production. Yeah, that one in particular tends to be pretty sensitive to soil acidity and how much phosphorus is in the soil. And if you have phosphorus, but the acidity isn't right, it won't absorb the phosphorus. And essentially what you're getting is you're planting a shrub that has already been juiced up at a nursery that first year you get blooms. The second year you get blooms, maybe a few less. By year three, you're just getting a handful of blooms. And after that, years down the road, you just get a nice green plant with not many flowers on it. It's it's the hydrangea that you will find. If you're buying a hydrangea from a grocery store, it's probably an endless <laughs> summer. And not to say that that's a bad thing. You know, it's rescue those plants. Plants at a Kroger in the front and the sidewalk need to be saved. You're or not. if we don't buy those plants and buy them from your local garden center instead, maybe Kroger will just kind of stop trying to sell Stop perennials. trying to sell plants yeah. and stick with groceries. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And that could be said for any chain box stores. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I feel like the endless summer hydrangea is like the knockout rose. It's just everywhere. You just yeah. find them everywhere. But it's not. Just because it's available everywhere and very, very, very well advertised doesn't mean it's a good product. Well, well, you know, Skittles are available everywhere. And I wouldn't recommend that you always eat Skittles. (laughs) True. (laughs) Or Diet Coke. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Ethan, do you hear that? What? Oh, it's an ad. Real quick, thanks for listening to our episode today. You can stay in touch with us by supporting us on Patreon. We are at patreon.com slash take it or leave it. And we'll have bonus content on Patreon for all of our subscribers there where you can get extra episodes and snippets from the show that we don't release to all the other platforms. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube at take it or leave it pod. And you can also visit our website, take it or leave it pod.com. If you have any questions, or comments or any stories you'd like us to research or talk about or hell send us a picture of a plant you want us to identify you can send that information to show at take it or leaf it pod.com you can also follow us on our individual instagrams i am at hortwise h-o-r-t-w-i-s-e and i am at n farringdon n-f-a-r-r-i-n-g-d-o-n Thanks so much. We'll get back to the episode. Oh, uh, you got me. <laughs> anyway, off topic there. So back on track. Blah, 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 blah. All right, Macrophyllus. So you would start to say about, you talk about the hardiness yes. uh, of it. And so, yes. They, I think with a lot of the newer varieties, they're probably a little less finicky on the soil acidity. They do, would you say, tend to be a little more finicky on light how much light exposure they have. Yeah, well, well, like a hosta, a macrophylla hydrangea is usually listed, or like an azalea as well, mm-hmm. listed as being more adaptable to shadier spots or dappled light morning or eastern sun. exposure, yeah, which would be the morning sun, that they can adapt to more sun. You just have to be more conscientious of your watering yeah if they're in full bloom and you're not careful about the watering or have an irrigation system yeah gonna be you'll notice them crash quicker than some of these other varieties right but as far as if you want to keep that shrub low maintenance and be a low maintenance gardener planted in dappled lights or eastern exposure although the more south you get that eastern exposure could still be a lot of sun true and you might notice flagging i think that that type of hydrangea is way more prone to where it starts to look like it's the wilting. foliar starts to wilt mm-hmm. and so i'll talk to people about that too it's like well i water it all the time and it's yeah. always looks wilted if that's it, not if you only notice it starting to look wilted like once it gets into the afternoon 
You know, if it's wilting in the morning, that from the could previous be water day, stress. That could be water. But if it's just wilting during the hottest parts of the day, that's likely what's happening. It's yeah, just reducing the ability to be, you know, the loss of moisture through the leaves. So it kind of drops its leaves, kind of canoes them a little bit, and that's a self defense mechanism that a lot of plants uh, utilize. And so I always tell people, well, keep an eye on it because if it's wilting at two thirty in the afternoon in July, but by seven o'clock. In it the evening, again. it's like looks beautiful and gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Um, then it's not a water issue; it's just heat stress. Yeah, but a lot of macros also old wood blooms. Yes. So yeah, that's what I was going to point out next too. As far as pruning, since those do bloom on the previous year's growth, sometimes two year old growth mm, for best sure. flower production. Yeah. So if you're doing, if you're a person who gets carried away with pruning, this would not be the shrub for you because if you go and chop it back. You're just, again, clipping off what would be new blooms in your current season. More than half of the time I am discussing blooming issues on macrophylla hydrangeas with homeowners, we've discussed that they're pruning the plant and that's why they don't have flower production. One of the first questions I ask, yeah, it's not blooming. Like, did you prune it? Like, yes, I prune it every year. Like, that's why. Mm -hmm. Or I did prune it last year. You know, it was getting a little big, so I pruned it back last year. Well, that's why you're not seeing flower production. Sure. So just something to keep in mind with that type of hydrangea. Yeah. So I think that pretty well wraps up the big leaf for the macrophylla. Yeah. So I guess to kind of summarize, you know, it's does. I, I also would say that it's bloom time. I don't find the macrophylla to bloom as prolifically as the mountain hydrangea or certainly not the panicle hydrangea. Mm-hmm. It does tend to have a, a smaller window. It blooms earlier than a panicle, starts to bloom earlier, but I don't see it blooming as prolifically into the dire heat of summer. Mm, sure. So I don't find it. Now, there are some reblooming varieties that they have started to produce where it kind of fizzles out in the dire heat of the summer, but then... Picks as, up again later. Right, exactly. So just also something to keep in mind that if you mix both of them in your landscape, say of like macrophylla and a panicle hydrangea, your macrophylla hydrangeas are likely going to start blooming earlier in the season. And then around the time that they're sort of slowing down on their flower production during the heat or the kick in to the heat of the summer is when the panicle hydrangea really starts to flower. Sure. So using those in conjunction with each other is a good way to prolong that hydrangea bloom time in your garden space. Okay. Do you want to cover smooth hydrangea next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the smooth hydrangea, that's your Annabelle. I think that's the common one that a mm-hmm. lot of people think when you when you say smooth hydrangea. There's also the native hydrangea, mm-hmm. the native uh, Midwestern hydrangea or native North American hydrangea is a hydrangea arborescence. And so, also one of the hardier of the varieties of hydrangeas, hardy up to Right up there three. with panicle hydrangeas, mm-hmm. extremely hardy. Also tends to bloom on new and old wood. Mm-hmm. It's capable of doing both. It also has a quite the long bloom time. The native species and the Annabelle species, the Annabelle being bred from the native to have a larger bloom. You might notice and be familiar with the fact that in a heavy rain, you get a very floppy on the ground hydrangea because that flower is so large. Mm -hmm. They have made some improvements. I think PW, was it PW that made the Incredible? Yeah, there's um, Incredible and and Invincible. And those are supposed to have a, oh, Incredible was an even larger flower. Invincible is the one that I think has the sturdier stem structure mm-hmm. on it. So mm-hmm. a similar size flower as your traditional smooth hydrangea, but a sturdier stem that's a little bit more resistant to that flop over doing heavy rind or heavy rain. And part of that, too, they tend to have more branches that are coming up from the ground. Like they can tend to spread a little bit. Sure. Whereas something like a mountain or a panicle has a very distinct shrub structure. So as far as in winter, the the panicle, for example, will look like a woody shrub and the smooth or the arborescence hydrangea will have more kind of stalks up from the ground. Right. And, also, and part of that, I think, is is what contributes to you can get some floppy stems. I think as far as the, the smooth hydrangea goes, as far as pruning goes, yeah, that's nothing we really kind of talk too much about, but... The smooth hydrangeas are one of the ones that I find to be more regularly pruned back, like 
mm-hmm. pretty heavy pruned back because it's you, so many individual stalks. Right, and yeah. knowing that it can still produce flowers on the new wood, just like the panicle hydrangea, it's not uncommon to see the uh, general practice of hard prune back in late fall or very usually early spring uh, mm-hmm. for that particular plant. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's a predominantly white flower. They have done more recent experimentation mm-hmm. and hybridization of creating more pink tones mm-hmm. in the smooth hydrangea family. Usually um, on your lighter pinks or your yes. mauves. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So there are some varieties that you might find, but traditionally when it comes to smooth hydrangea, white, I think, is the color that you're going to be most presented with. Mm-hmm. But a very easy to grow hydrangea, pretty much flexible of most sun conditions. I think it's happiest in a dappled light or... Yeah within four hours of sun exposure Mm -hmm. however it can adapt extremely well to full sun like the panicle as long as you are watering appropriately yeah i think for the average person who maybe isn't quite as attentive for watering i tend to see them definitely do best in either like that morning sun or under a tree with the canopy that allows some light in that kind of thing for sure yeah the smooth hydrangea because there's just not as much you know you're not going to get any color changing aspect on that necessarily and you know you're you're limited on color choices however they have started to finally kind of brought in with some of these new dwarf species i think there's a wee white and a mini mauvette and uh, you might have had mixed experiences with those I know you and I have had mixed experiences where yeah, you generally mixed bad. Mixed bad. <laughs> uh, I was just telling telling if you by mixed, you mean bad? Then yes, <laughs> <laughs> certainly one of the plants that I've seen the wee white and the mini mavet, and there was a pink one too. I think they were all PW. Seem to, for whatever reason, struggle even in the nursery setting. Um, yeah, I don't know that I've seen them look good even at the nursery. Right. Yeah. And that was always something that was kind of a struggle. However, I have seen them look nice in landscapes. So mm-hmm. it's something that now that I have seen really look good the way that a picture on the internet would showcase that plant, mm-hmm. I will start to kind of lower my guard towards those dwarf species because I love the idea of that being a nice three foot smooth hydrangea whereas or traditionally under. right whereas traditionally a smooth hydrangea you usually need to at least create a space for five feet give or take yeah five six seven eight even mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, although like invincible spirit two and some of those that are more if on you the can pink even end, find that where the yeah. hell are you finding that could be like four to five feet but yeah Yep. So with smooth hydrangeas, relatively easy to care for. Not much information there. I mean, I, it's pretty much a tried and true, you know, that Annabelle hydrangea. It's pretty forgiving and mm-hmm. easy to maintain and care for. So mm-hmm. if you, that's kind of what you're looking for. It's Particularly cer- for your shadier to morning sun kind of areas. Right. I still find myself leaning towards the panicle, though. Like, I'm still going to, before I would take someone to a smooth hydrangea, I my my issue with panicles in lower light a lot of people aren't fertilizing them they're not keeping up on pruning and that combined with lower light I just see them tend to look thin and kind of stringy and stretched and not as healthy if somebody said I have a shady spot what kind of hydrangea would I should I put there panicle would be one of my last choices for me personally for a heavy shade spot yeah yeah or even dappled or yeah okay Speaking of shade, oak leaf, oak leaf hydrangea next. Also beautiful. I think oak leaves are my second favorite hydrangea mm, okay. choice. Yeah. I and really like them. given that name, because the leaf shape of that category of hydrangeas yeah. generally looks more similar to like a red or a pin oak. Right. An oak tree leaf shape. And its name is hydrangea quercifolia. And whereas quercifolia literally means oak leaf. That's right truly what it means (laughs) right because the genus for oak is quercus or quercus so depending on where you're at with your pronunciations typically sold for shade although we were just discussing before we started recording all the times we've seen them planted in southern facing full sun areas and again if you keep up on your watering they definitely can adapt to that but generally sold as more of a shade hydrangea generally going to be on the larger end Four to eight feet, although Mm -hmm. there are some varieties like what? Ruby slippers. Ruby slippers, I think the tag says three to four feet, Mm -hmm. but 
I tell people be prepared for a larger plant. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, there's times that you can buy in a container and it's already three plus Mm -hmm. feet tall. I very rarely even see them. So (laughs) yeah, it's certainly one that I would tell people be prepared for a five foot shrub, Mm -hmm. maybe Mm -hmm. sometimes bigger. But yes, I think that that could take those bloom on old wood and you don't want to do much pruning that could get a little tricky. Right. Yeah. It's definitely an old wood bloomer. But really a cool plant. It's just, it's different. It's got, that's the It blooms almost in more of a kind of a column. Very elongated yeah. spire flower. Mm-hmm. And the ruby slippers is one that goes from white to pink. But there are some oak leaves that primarily stay white. Yeah. Although anymore, it seems like some of the newer introductions do the white to pink shift. Mm-hmm. Like we see in a lot of the panicle varieties. Right. What I love about the oak leaf is the exfoliating bar. It's just, it's it's got character mm-hmm. you it's okay to have so i think oak leaf hydrangeas look best when they have a little bit of an openness to them mm-hmm. and you can really see that branch structure and you get that exfoliating peeling bark mm-hmm. and this really cool kind of jagged woven branch structure in there it just and with that different leaf, you can very yes. easily mix it into a landscape with existing other more common types of hydrangeas, and it mm-hmm. still looks very different. And it will naturally sort of, of develop that loss of foliation on the lower branches, accentuating that branching structure. It's mm-hmm. not uncommon for that to happen. So if that's something you don't like, and you don't like branches of your shrubs to be really openly exposed like that, you can always plant a lower growing plant around it you know hostas Mm -hmm. or boxwoods or something like that and have the oak leaf hydrangea kind of growing behind those thicker foliated plants sure there's always ways to incorporate them in your landscape depending on what you like whether you want that hydrangea to be a showcase specimen or you just want it to sort of amplify and add a little bit of texture here and there in your landscape and i would say a lot of the ones i see in full sun tend to be super super full very full. It's yeah. it's while it is like you said, usually sold as a shade tolerant or part sun tolerant. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, seen them look gorgeous in full unrelenting sun as yeah. well. So definitely, I would imagine though that you have to well maintain them. I think mm-hmm. average homeowner, I'm not going to suggest that plant. Like, oh yeah, just go put it out by your mailbox. Right. Um. You know, if you do. You're going to want to water that plant yeah. very regularly. Again, not my first pick if I'm doing a full sun hydrangea. Correct. Yeah. Also, a common characteristic of a lot of the oak leaf hydrangeas is a little bit of a fall coloration on there. Mm-hmm. It's not uncommon mm-hmm. for them to get this sort of burgundy, even sometimes splashes of orange mm-hmm. or a more vibrant red in the leaf before the leaf drops at the end of the season. Sure. Yeah, another extra season of color on there. Mm-hmm. Not a long season bloomer, though. I wouldn't call the oak leaf hydrangea. It's not going to bloom as prolifically as a panicle hydrangea does. Sure. And when, when they are done, and that's... With some of the more woody forms of hydrangeas, the panicles, the oak leaves, for example, they do tend to retain those dried flowers at the end of the season very well. So you do get a winter interest element or people will use them as a cut dried flower. Mm -hmm. So you do have something there to look at in winter after the leaves have dropped, which is just kind of a fun extra thing. Right. Yeah, definitely a cool plant and certainly has a, an interesting use in any given landscape. Yeah. And do you want to cover climbing hydrangeas? The last, last hydrangea on our list. Now this, we had earlier said that the mountain hydrangea being the second hardest hydrangea to likely find at a garden center in the Midwest, I mm-hmm. would say the climbing hydrangea is the hardest to find and probably the hydrangea that most people are unfamiliar with in yes. my experience. Yep but is a really cool option for a shady vine to use. So people will come into a garden center and they will want a a blooming, climbing vine plant. And I'm like, okay, let me show you a couple options. Not uncommon to head towards whether it's honeysuckle or clematis, but then they say, well, it's a lot of shade. I'm like, uh, mm-hmm. I'm probably not going to get much strong flower production if any on your clematis or honeysuckle in a heavy shade area so then i'll you know say like oh well we could talk about ivy or something like that or you know virginia creeper could be a little forgiving to heavy shaded areas like no i want flower 
Right. Well, climbing hydrangea, that's one of the best solutions, at least here in the, the Midwest, if you can find it. Right. But also something to consider is it has a very woody stem. As mm-hmm. it grows and it matures, it's also only going to bloom on old wood, which it's a vine. Most people I don't recommend to like hacking. getting on a ladder and <laughs> hacking on their vines. Right. But because it can more, develop. Would you compare it kind of like a grapevine? I would more say. More woody like that. I would say yes. Because a lot of people know what that looks like. That's a good, good idea. I'll use that more often to sort of describe in that, that as that grapevine matures, it develops that really thick woodiness or a wisteria. Mm-hmm. So it needs a strong thing to grow on. A cheap, flimsy plastic trellis is not going to be strong enough to support a climbing hydrangea. Mm-hmm. An iron or sturdy wood trellis or a sturdy fence. Or if it's growing against a structure. Right, like yeah. a brick yeah, a brick building or something like that. Mm. So just something to consider. But it is only going to be white, as far as I know. I'm only... More of an open, airy bloom. Very. It's not going to have that rounded, spherical... You're not going to have a macrophylla flower on a climbing hydrangea. Right. So it's definitely more open, white flower... Slow growing, though, folks, and that's why if you find them at a garden center, they're usually a little bit pricier. Yeah, you, you might have... spend forty to sixty dollars on a one to three gallon. Yeah, container. so they are more expensive. Definitely keep that in mind. But if you want a flowering, shade tolerant vine, it's that's about re- it. It's <laughs> really your best choice. Right. So, you know, weighing your options there. But it is certainly cool. And if you give it time to grow and you're in that house for more than 10 years right. after you plant it, you will certainly see a really cool uh, thing. And, and people will likely ask, well, what is that? Like, oh, that's my climbing hydrangea. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't have this for another 10 years in your landscape. <laughs> <Right>. So, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, definitely a fun place plant underutilized but underutilized because of availability i think yeah and that one is hydrangea pedialaris so yeah super cool definitely off the beaten path as far as where you think hydrangeas tend to go Mm -hmm. and how we would utilize them and i think that pretty well wraps up our coverage of the six varieties don't you think yeah yeah that kind of sums it up so just as far as any hydrangea though goes they like water. So whether yep. you are planting a hydrangea in shade or sun and or if it's a new planting, water your hydrangea well and thoroughly. They are shallow rooted plants. So even upon full establishment, while they can develop drought tolerance, mm-hmm. just like any shrub can in age, be prepared to have to periodically water them if we are in a drought summer. So that would be sure. my tip for success for any hydrangea. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that sums it up. You got a lot of information to digest on just hydrangeas, but my gosh, they are one of the most common landscape shrubs that we see and get yes. asked about. And I will also include a chart by Proven Winners in the episode description. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, that breaks down. They make a chart that has a photo with each variety that's very representative of that particular category of hydrangea as well as kind of the quick and dirty breakdown of when to prune and not prune zone hardiness uh, some of course proven winter specific varieties but some of the common varieties within that category so that's a quick easy chart if you have several different varieties and you're like oh, which one did they say it can be pruned and not pruned again just a very easy reference to have hanging around awesome Well, thank you for listening, everybody. As always, you can support us on our Patreon page. You can access our website at takeitorleafitpod.com. You can see our posts on our social media, Instagram and Facebook at takeitorleafitpod. And all those links will be in the episode description as well. Uh, YouTube, though, as well. (coughs) Okay. Sorry. I don't know. I choked on air. Yep. So... Bye, folks. (laughs) (laughs) Goodbye. (laughs) See you next week. (laughs) 